Hello, my name is Cole Arthur, and I'm a freshman in the Mechanical Engineering program. Today I will be presenting on the strategic importance of satellite launches and access to space, specifically within the Middle East. If this is well received, I may do future presentations regarding Southeast Asia, uh, South America, and Europe. But the Middle East is what we're going to go over today. Access to space is essential for modern life. We pertain many benefits from space, everything from weather forecasting to GPS to telecommunications. It's even more important for modern militaries, both for photo reconnaissance and secure communications. Thus, access to space is essential for almost every nation on Earth. How nations get access to space is a very interesting political issue, one that was brought to light by a news story from this week, in that there was an extremely large group of people that were protesting out of SpaceX's Hawthorne, California headquarters on the launch of a Turkish communications satellite that they claim could be used to kill Armenian civilians through drone strikes. I'm not going to discuss the validity of these claims, I'm not knowledgeable enough in the area, but this does shed a light on an often underappreciated aspect of international politics regarding satellite launching. And where better to start examining that than probably the most complex geopolitical region in the entire world, the Middle East. First, we've got to understand the domestic launch capabilities within the Middle East, specifically that of Iran and Israel. And in order to discuss Iran's, we first have to discuss North Korea's launch capability. Every rocket operated by any country in the world today can trace its roots back to the German B-2. And understanding exactly how they trace their roots back and how many iterations from the V-2 they are can give you a good idea of the complexity and how a rocket works. These rockets in particular trace their roots back to the Russian military V-2 program. The Russian military had a large interest in the V-2 because it was a rather effective weapon for the Nazis during World War II. However, they had issues militarizing that variant because uh, it was ethanol-fueled, and it seems that when you give Soviet troops large supplies of ethanol, the ethanol tends to disappear before it can be used as fuel. So they developed a new missile called the Scud that was essentially a V-2 but with the tanks vastly resized and the engine modified to run on hypergolic fuels. Now, the Scud was an extremely successful missile that has operated for almost 50 years, and it's been sold to nations all over the world, including North Korea eventually got their hands on one. The Soviet Union actually never sold North Korea Scud missiles because they generally worked on the best terms. However, the way that North Korea acquired one was that they sent Egypt some assistance during a war uh, in the early 1990s. And in exchange, they acquired about 20 of these Russian Scud missiles. North Korea had enough manufacturing base and engineering talent that they were able to reverse engineer and start manufacturing these missiles and they created an almost exact duplicate called the Wasong-5. Around this time, they started selling these internationally. They sold uh, actually some of the missiles and later the plans to Iran to create a rocket called the Shahab. They also sold all the same plans and missiles to Pakistan, uh, That was, and the Pakistanis created a variant called the Gari. It's believed that that is actually where a significant amount of North Korea's nuclear technology came from. So North Korea, uh, these missiles are very good as missiles, but they're not quite big enough to get something into orbit. So in the early 2000s, North Korea began to develop an orbital launch vehicle. Uh, they called it Anha. It was essentially four Scud engines uh, clustered around a larger tank with a Scud missile on top and some sort of smaller third unknown stage. Uh, they launched their first satellite in about 2011 successfully, and uh, they've been scaling up their space program ever since. 
They also, it's believed, uh, sold some of this technology to the Iranians, and they created a rocket variant known as the Safir, which is essentially their Shahab missile, also known as the Wasong-5, North Korean missile, uh, with a stretched tank, and it's believed that it's just two of these stacked on top of each other with some sort of unknown third stage. Finally, recently we've seen a new rocket developed in Iran called the Samoak. This is very, very similar to the North Korean Ana, but with one key difference. They've actually began to develop a fairly high-tech second stage that uses a carbon fiber wrapped composite, as well as uh, a thrust vectoring nozzle, which allows it to be controlled in the vacuum of space. They launched their first uh, re true reconnaissance satellite about six months ago, and it's believed that they now do have a functioning spy satellite program, though it's probably rather crude and in its early stages. North Korea, on the other hand, uh, they may become significantly more uh, capable in terms of spacefaring technology soon. You probably heard about that unveiling of the enormous new North Korean intercontinental ballistic missile on the news over the last few weeks. And a lot of people have speculated that it might not work, but it would be very consistent with a program we've believed to have been going on in North Korea for a long time. It's believed that uh, towards the fall of the Soviet Union, they either acquired engines or scientists who worked on engines uh, for a Russian dual engine bell uh, single turbo pump design. These are some of Russia's best rocket engines. In fact, uh, rocket engines from the same family are now used on the American Atlas V and Antares boosters. And North Korea, if they were to go and put these engines on a launch vehicle, which they very well could do in the next two to three years, could have a true medium lift launch vehicle, which would allow them to launch significant reconnaissance satellites. Back to the Middle East. It's probably worth mentioning the one other domestically produced rocket in the Middle East, the Shavit 2. That is produced by the Israelis, and it was began development in the early 1980s after, in the late 1970s, the Israelis were unable to get intelligence time on U.S. satellites as quickly as they would like, so they began to develop their own reconnaissance assets. The Shavit 2 is a very strange rocket. It launches retrograde over the Mediterranean. And because of this, has almost half the capacity it would if it launched the correct direction around the Earth. However, it's necessary as they definitely don't want to be dropping stages on their neighbors to the east. As for how it's actually assembled, it's relatively high-tech, but not remarkable in any way. It's two identical solid rocket stages stacked on top of each other, both relatively high-tech with technologies such as thrust vectoring, with a more high-tech spin-stabilized stage on the very top. The Shavit 2 really only makes sense for the Israeli military, where secrecy is paramount. Because they've gotten a good enough relationship with the West, that they are able to launch on European and US vehicles. That's where the majority of their civilian and even less classified military payloads end up. They even launched their very own moon lander on the SpaceX Falcon 9 uh, about a year ago, and it almost worked. This was the approach taken by the other two satellite operators in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Both had both the United States and Russia launch their assets over the last several years, and they operate their own commercial and military satellites, though they were all launched by foreign companies. The United Arab Emirates even had the Japanese launch their Hope Mars mission. This dynamic of needing to be aligned with the United States and Russia to launch satellites can, puts an interesting spin on the ever-increasing web of alliances within the Middle East, reminiscent of the Cold War era, and it could have major ramifications for the world as a whole over the coming decades. Thank you for listening to my presentation today.